Tensions between South American neighbors Venezuela and Guyana escalated this week over a century-old territorial dispute. Today, Venezuela signaled openness to high-level talks to resolve the standoff, but Guyana has yet to respond. Ali Rogan has more. Last week, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro held a referendum to declare sovereignty over a resource-rich region that makes up two-thirds of Guyana's territory. Maduro pledged to begin oil and mining exploration immediately. Let's see where on the map we will celebrate tonight. Long live the complete map of Venezuela. Long live the homeland. Long live all of Venezuela. Both countries have claimed ownership of the Essequibo region since its borders were decided in favor of Guyana over a century ago when Guyana was still a British colony. But the discovery in recent years of 11 billion barrels worth of oil and gas off Guyana's coast gave new life to the dispute. New oil drilling is driving huge gains in Guyana's economy as Venezuela's economy flounders despite its own massive reserves. Carolina Jimenez Sandoval is president of the Washington Office on Latin America, a research organization that advocates for human rights in Latin America. Carolina, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit more about the importance that Essequibo has played in recent years and decades in terms of the culture of both of these countries? I think for Venezuela, this is an old century um, issue. Uh, um, most Venezuelans grew up um, and, you know, believing strongly, reinforcing the idea that the Esequibo is part of Venezuela, but that it is a, it's a territory in dispute. Uh, and, 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 you know, as children, uh, in school books, people used to draw the Esequibo region with dotted lines saying, you know, territory to be claimed. For Guyana, it's its territory. I mean, it's, it, it, comp it comprises two-thirds of, of the current Guyana's uh, uh, as a country territory. So I think it is indeed, um, you know, a, a very complex country when you have a country that lives there, that occupies the territory effectively, and another one claiming its historical rights uh, to the land. And why is Maduro taking these steps at this time? I think there are two things that are important to understand when one sees the current conflict. One is oil. That's a huge reserve. And it's a very important, as we know, uh, product for the world, even today. But the second, and I think it's really important to think about this, is internal Venezuelan politics. Maduro is a deeply unpopular leader, and he's also deeply authoritarian. And uh, he faces presidential elections in 2024. At the end of October, the opposition, for the first time in years, self-organized primary elections to choose one candidate who could run against Maduro in 2024. It seems the Maduro government underestimated this uh, citizen exercise because it was self-managed. The, the National Electoral Authority didn't play any role. Uh, over 2.3 million people voted, including people in different cities around the world because the diaspora had a chance to participate. And the support went overwhelmingly to one candidate, Maria Corina Machado. The government seems to have been taken by surprise. As a result, uh, we see a tremendous propaganda apparatus set in place to then change the narrative and, and you know, take all the attention away from that issue and make everyone speak about a territorial dispute that is over a century years old. And how is this playing out with the average Venezuelan? What are they thinking of this? And how do they view Nicolas Maduro in this context? When you look at the, at the referendum itself, what you notice is that although Maduro claimed that 10.4 million people went to vote, uh, independent media and citizens themselves reported, uh, reported a very low turnout. So I think his lack of popularity really shows around this. And I think Venezuela was want a peaceful transition to democracy because it's, you know, for many years, human rights violations have been at the forefront of his leadership. How is Guyana responding? For Guyana, this is an existential threat. Right? I mean, uh, Maduro is claiming, you know, two-thirds of their territory. And uh, I think the president of Guyana has been, um, you know, very clear about, first of all, defending, you know, their, their country. But they have also, I mean, the, the government has also been very strategic at uh, rallying support from its allies, the U.S. government, 
has very clearly said that it supports Guyana. Um, I think the Guyanese government has also gone to the UN Security Council, has you know tried to rally support among Caribbean countries. So it's a, it seems that the strategy is to get as much international support as possible to avoid an escalation of the crisis. And how big is the risk of escalation here? There have been troop movements that have uh, taken place as a result, but what is the possibility that this turns mm -hmm. into some sort of a, a confrontation? Mm -hmm. Maduro's nationalistic rhetoric seems to, you know, uh, promote the idea that the government is willing to go to the very end, whatever the consequences, to reclaim this territory. But the reality that it is that uh, Maduro's allies will not support, you know, any further escalation of the conflict, and, uh, and I don't think, you know, any leader in the region or or even the U.S. wants another war <laughs> in the world, and certainly a war in South America. So, despite its uh, loud narrative about going all the way. Uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of international resistance. And in terms of the United States' response, they've come out squarely behind Guyana, but at the same time, the United States lifted sanctions, yeah. oil sanctions on Venezuela earlier this year in exchange for some electoral concessions in the upcoming election, allowing opposition candidates to stand. At least that was the agreement, if not in, in practice. Yeah. How does this affect um, that situation with the United yeah. States? I think Maduro keeps putting uh, uh, the U.S. government to a major dilemma, to continue supporting negotiations between the democratic opposition and the government, to continue supporting the agreements signed in Barbados, and at the same time, you know, to react to Maduro's uh, actions around the Esequibo and to demand that it fulfills agreements, because so far the U.S. indeed lifted sanctions, but Maduro hasn't done you know, his part. He hasn't released uh, political prisoners that are Americans or other political prisoners. He still hasn't given proper electoral guarantees for the elections in 2024. But I think the best thing the U.S. can do is to continue supporting the negotiation process between the opposition and the Maduro government, supporting human rights and, uh, you know, for Venezuelans inside the country and outside the country and to oppose any further escalation of this crisis. Carolina Jimenez-Sandoval with the Washington Office on Latin America, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.